Um, so welcome to class, everybody. Um, it's late and it's weird. That's another weird thing for me is I'm usually not teaching this late. I'm more of a morning person when it comes to teaching. So yeah, walking to school is like just a very different kind of vibe. The whole thing is just sort of like upside down, it feels like. Um, this weekend was the Super Bowl um, and I did some grading. That's why I'm thinking of the Super Bowl right now is this slide on the karma tales. Here, maybe I'll dim these. What do you guys think? That's probably not the best. Actually, that looks pretty good. Is that good light level? You guys like that? Um, so yeah, I I, uh, I was doing some grading the day of the Super Bowl, and I was grading your karma tales. Does anybody have any reflections on Tom Brady and his victory? It feels like a long time ago all of a sudden, but it was only a couple of days ago. He's yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I, I don't know. He said he's not going to do it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting point. So that he's 43 this year, is that right? So two more years of Brady. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, the, the Patriots tank. Yeah, well, and that's the other thing is I think all, all the fans, I don't know, you know, it, people in the chat, feel free to, to chime in here. But I feel like most of the fans were rooting for Mahomes, the sort of young upstart challenger, right? But it was the old goat who came through in the end. Uh, I was listening to an interview on the way over here with a sports writer. And he asked kind of an interesting question. Is like, do you think he's happy? Does he look happy to you? And I don't know the answer to that. Do you, what do you guys think? Does Tom Brady look happy to you? Yeah. You, look, you think he looks happy? Uh-huh. Okay. The, the point that the sports writer was making is that no, by like making these choices, he's like cutting himself off from kind of a different phase of life, right? And he compared him to like Michael Jordan, who, you know, had kind of a, what to say, a less clear end, right? He had, I don't know if you guys watched like the Jordan documentary that came out a few months ago. Um, but anyways, he, he played baseball for a year that he came back and he played pretty well, but not quite as good. And then it was sort of this sort of trail off. And basically this sports writer's point was kind of like yours, right? It's quit, quit while you're ahead, right? Quit while you're at the top. So it's sort of a hard decision. Um, he looked used to it. Yeah, it's almost like he expected to win, right? Almost like almost like these gods we were talking about in class, right? He's at the top, there's nowhere to go except down, right? Where it's like just to maintain kind of the status quo, he's got to win. It's a lot of pressure, but he, you know, he pulled it off. It's kind of an amazing thing. So you got you, you got to take your hat off to him or, or whatever that saying is. Um so karma tales, I enjoyed reading your karma tales. Um in it was sort of diagnostic in a way this is a, a teacher trick where you give an assignment early and just sort of see where everybody's at i think most of you are upperclassmen right you're juniors and seniors and so a lot of you've kind of done the paper thing before so um in general across the board the grades were quite high um hopefully you all know how to find your grade i think i wrote like short little response to the individual paper and so it was just like off the cuff remarks that generally told you what I thought about it. If you want detailed response, I wrote this in the email I sent you. Um, I'm happy to give you that and more, um, but let's uh, set up an appointment, right? Because that's really how you learn how to write. Um, I was actually a chemistry major when I was an undergrad and I never really did learn how to write. I took some classes where I had to like, just kind of drill it out all night. And I was just like, all right, get that out of, out of my life, get that away from me. Um, but the real way to learn how to write is slowly, thoughtfully editing and conversation with other people, right? Even now, I'm, I, I'm a professional writer of sorts. I mean, that's not quite true, but I, I do a lot of writing. I was writing today, I was writing yesterday, I write almost every day. Um, and good writing is edited writing. And better writing is when other people edit it for you, right? And so it's a conversation. Um, so anyways, if you're interested in improving your writing skills, that is something I'm happy to help you with, right? In addition to learning about Buddhism, I can try to help teach you how to write. Um, and a lot of writing, uh, a lot of good writing is just clear thinking. And so 
Um, the best papers come from early conversations where you say, hey, I want to write about this. And I say, have you thought about this? And how are you going to support that part? You're like, oh, I never thought about that. And then we go back and forth. And that's how you end up with a really solid paper. So any, anyways, looking forward, again, this was our first assignment of the year, kind of diagnostic, just seeing where we're at, showing you what I expect of you, right? My general, um, what, general expectations for the course, which is to just, um, you know, do the reading, reflect on it, cite it in your work, and then be able to make some sort of argument or analysis based on that uh, course material. Um, so anyways, it was basically just kind of like an introductory assignment and going forward, we'll do a lot of the same kind of stuff. Um, any, does anybody have any reflections on their karma tale? Does anybody wanna share their karma tales? I actually, I opened this up to the last class and I was surprised because I, I teach two sections of, of Buddhism and somebody actually took me up on it. So I don't, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but if anybody would like to share, you're welcome to. Um, but even just more generally, does anybody have reflections on the assignment? Did you think it was easy, hard, interesting, boring, fun, somewhere in the middle? Any reflections? Chat? Nothing? I thought it was a good way to like practice applying the concepts and stuff like that. So it was helpful to start off the course. OK. So thumbs up from Sophie. Very good. Um, and one thing I noticed, as you can see, I underlined this part, right? And I, I even wrote this uh, in response to probably about half of your papers. Uh, it was difficult to come up with an idea that has happened to me. Yeah. So this is something I was trying to kind of stretch your sense of self a little bit, right? So on the one hand, to write about um, what is your life like, right? What is happening in your life? What's sort of real to you? But then what is also happening kind of behind the scenes and in other lives, right? So this is from the instructions, karma of a previous or future life. And so most people were able to write like, hey, I did this good thing and then something good happened to me and I'll probably have a good future life, something like that, which is not exactly taking it as far as I would have liked, right? I wanted to see a little imagination mixed in with reality. And because it's creative writing, you know, it's um, the assignment is relatively open and we kind of come back to what Aiden's talking about is that it's a little bit hard to come up with the ideas. But again, that's sort of the point of the story. And um, as I think about why, right, it's hard to imagine multiple lives, right? We grow up in a society where uh, for whatever reason, you know, maybe this is one reason, this is a Catholic school, right? And so perhaps I, I had very high expectations that Catholic, Catholic school students would be able to imagine multiple lives. Um, we live in a world where multiple lives is silly. Why would you ever think you have multiple lives, right? Um, there's a figure named Ian Stevenson, who's kind of interesting. Ian Stevenson. Um, let's see, what does Carlos say? I think it challenged my creativity, especially because it was so early in the course and we haven't written for you before. Or for me, I've written much about Buddhism at all before this assignment. Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. It is just the second or third week of class, right? And so to expect you to have like a full grasp on Buddhism, of course, is not a very realistic expectation. Um, and Ian Stevenson, th this uh, researcher, I think he passed away a few years ago, but he's an interesting figure. He, um, he was in a department of parapsychology at the University of Virginia. And you might hear the term parapsychology and think what the hell is that? But it, it's basically like investigating um, what happens after people die. And he went around interviewing people in the United States and in other countries who claim to have had experiences of multiple lives. And basically he found, you know, in, in one half of the world, people assume that there's one life and generally operate according to those principles. In the other half of the world, people assume that there are multiple lives and generally operate according to those principles. And of course, I'm not trying to say that one is more true or false than the other one. Um, in many ways, it, it's all just assumptions, right? We don't really have very good uh, definitive data in either direction. Um, so yeah, what I was trying to do is challenge your assumptions, which um, of course is, is uh, a difficult task, especially without a lot of training. So looking forward, um, this again will be part of the class, right? Is we'll be reading difficult things. We'll be discussing topics that might be kind of unfamiliar. And I encourage you, just like Kyla is saying, is to try to take that challenge, right? And try to expand the way that you think. Um, okay. Other thoughts, other reflections on the assignment? 
again, I think it was very successful. The grades were all very good. So, you know, nobody should feel like they failed it or anything like that. Um, one thing to think about, too, is this blind man and the elephant. Um, it is this, Buddhism is this big, complicated system, right? And we, as the blind men who are approaching this elephant, can't really see the whole thing. And so we hold on to what is most familiar to us. And so what is most familiar to us is if I do good things, good things will happen to me. If I do bad things, bad things will happen to me. Is that a part of Buddhism? Absolutely. Yes, 100%, right? And we saw that across the board. The more challenging thing will be to kind of reach beyond the part that we've already grasped onto, right? And be able to see the other pieces that are, are you know, easier to ignore. Um, so that's, I think that's enough of that. Yeah, these are the karma tales. So today we are shifting gears and we are talking about the life story of the Buddha. So hopefully um, you all have a copy of this by now. And if you do, um, hopefully you have it nearby because we are going to work with this book today. If you don't, uh, I uploaded at least half of the book. I think this was a scan that I made. Let's see if I have it available. Uh, I don't see it. it. Must be in a different folder. So in any case, I, I scanned about half of the reading for today um, for a previous semester, just for people who didn't get the book yet. So in any case, you can work from that scan. It is on Moodle. So um, I encourage you to download it now. So you have it available to talk about it in a moment. Um, but yes, do get this book. If you haven't gotten already, it's at the bookstore. Um, we need it and we're reading it now and we've already read 50 pages of it. So we're, we're gonna read the rest of it like next week and then we'll be done with it. And if you get it after that, it won't be very useful to you. Um, here's an overview of the book. I didn't assign the, the uh, introduction, but, or the prologue, I should say. Um, and I'm kind of giving you the highlights in these slides. I was thinking about assigning it. I've assigned it in previous versions of this class before, but I think in the end, there's actually not a ton of information there that you really need. Um, if you'd like to read it, of course, I encourage you to. Um, and one thing I'll say too, before we get into the contents of the book is this book is very special to me as a person because um, it's translated by my dear professor. So if you open to this kind of title page, you will see that the translator is Curtis Schaefer. And he was my professor in graduate school. And we even read this book in Tibetan. So this is a Tibetan language book. It's a translation from a Tibetan language book. Um, and we read the Tibetan in class together. So uh, we were reading actually this part about um, being in the womb and kind of his experiences there. And I, I'm sure you all remember that part uh, because it's really weird. Or at least if you do remember that part, you remember it being really weird. And so when I was translating that, I remember thinking like, this can't be right. It's talking about like 10 stories, sandalwood palaces inside of his mother's womb. What the hell is this stuff? Um, so anyways, it, it's, this is a book that, uh, yeah, I feel very kind of personally attached to. And that's one reason that I've assigned it to you all. Um, as you can see, the author's name is Tenzin Chugyal. Maybe I'll write this in the chat, Tenzin Chugyal. So his first name should be pretty easy to say, Tenzin. Have you guys ever heard this name before, Tenzin? So the Dalai Lama's name is also Tenzin. It's, the second part is different, but his name is Tenzin Gyatso. Um, so why don't I say his name? The, the, and I guess I'll, I'll point this out before I ask you to say it. The O with the two dots over it. Do you know what those two dots are? Have you ever seen two dots on a name on a vowel sound before? Anybody in the chat? It's an umlau. So if you if you've ever studied German, for example, they use umlauts a lot. And a lot of the time, uh, rather than draw the two dots, what um, people will often do is make it an O E. So some people might spell this name C H O E G Y E L. Um, you've seen maybe people named Mueller, right? M U E L L E R, right? Um, but that should be a, a U with an umlaut over it in German. So, anyways, uh, it makes the O sound a little bit different. So rather than Cho, it becomes Chu. So I'm going to say his name, and then I'll ask you guys to say it. So his name is Tenzin Chugyal. Tenzin Chugyal. Tenzin Chugyal. 
Tenzin Chugyo. Yeah, very good. All right, so Tenzin Chugyo, he's our author. Um, he is Bhutanese. Actually, I should say he's, uh, let's just say he's Tibetan. He lives in Bhutan, which um, is a, a country. Um, and he went, he lived during the 17th century. So let's see, where do they talk about Tenzin Chugyo? Yeah, on 22, so Roman numeral 22. We, we learn a little bit about him and his life and his situation. Again, this is all kind of background. It, he, he lived during the 1600s, right? The 17th century. Um, and so relatively recent, right? This version of the life story of the Buddha is only a few hundred years old. But these 12 acts, right? These 12 major events in the Buddha's life are very, very old. People have been telling the life story of the Buddha like this for thousands of years, about let's say 2,000 years or so. The Buddha lived 2,500 years ago. So it's a very old story that's been told in many different ways, many different times. But these 12 pieces remain pretty stable. And again, they're listed off on uh, Roman numeral 10, as you can see at the bottom of the slide there. Um, so different authors will add to this general framework, right? They'll add details, especially about his different teachings or the other various events of his life, but they'll all include some version of these 12 different acts. Um, as you can see, some of them cover very sh short amounts of time. Some are a bit longer. Some things happen very suddenly, like uh, when he's 35 years old, he's battling with demons and achieving enlightenment. Those are all several uh, major events in just one year. But then he teaches from the age 35 till 80 years old. And we actually don't cover that basically at all in this book, right? Most of this book is just leading up to his enlightenment. And then it skips to his death, basically. Um, so, and as you can also see, birth is the third act, right? That's kind of weird. Um, and so as we think about those karma tales I asked you to write and the, and the, the role of reincarnation in this Buddhist world, it's baked into the very beginning of this story as well, right? Rather than beginning with his parents or him being born or something like that, it begins with his life before he even is born, his previous life. And that's what I was sort of trying to push you guys to do in that assignment is to be able to think about yourself as beyond even this life, this body. And of course, this is how um, this book begins as well. Um, so any questions so far? Again, this is just kind of a table of contents, basically, of what is yet to come. Okay. Um, this is also from the introduction, and um, it's, I think, very beautifully written. Again, it's my teacher, so I, I have nothing but praise for him. Um, it's these short declarative sentences for the first few pages of the introduction. Um, we've got the Buddha was a human being, and it goes on to say kind of what that means. The Buddha was a prince. He was a reincarnation, right? We were just talking about reincarnation. The Buddha was a god. And so that's something that we will explore as well, which might be sort of surprising, right? Because we began the class saying that Buddhism has gods in it, right? They're in that wheel of rebirth. Um, but the Buddha himself is not really a god. And so this is sort of strange, confusing language. And we're going to think about what does that mean? The Buddha was a god. The Buddha was a bodhisattva. That's probably a new term. And so we're going to explore what that means in a moment. Again, um, as you are reading this, there's probably a lot of terms you're not familiar with. Um, and bodhisattva may have been one of them, right? And so that's something that we can explore together in class is this, this kind of new terminology. What does it mean? And then finally, this last one's the most confusing, I would say, is the Buddha was, is, ever will be the cosmos. And so um, the Buddha as a human should be pretty clear, right? He was born, um, he was born in India 2,500 years ago. That's the story of the Buddha that maybe we are most familiar with. And again, we're going to get to that. He was a prince, he was reborn. But this idea that the Buddha was a god um, again, goes back to this wheel of life. Before he is even born on this earth, he's up in heaven and he's looking down and he's sort of thinking about what's going on with all the people down there. Um, so that should be relatively clear, right? Again, we've got this wheel of life. We've got the gods at the top. His name when he was a god, I'm not going to ask you to remember it, but it is Shveta Ketu. 
And so, of course, that's different than his name when he's a human. Um, and so when he's reborn as a human, his name is Siddhartha. And that is a name I'm going to ask you to know, but we'll, we'll get to that when it is time. Um, and so he is all of these things and more. He's a very sort of confusing character to wrap your head around. And this idea of multiple lives is a part of it, right? When I ask you to write uh, something about your own life involving multiple lives, it forces you to reach beyond your present state of being, right? Even your present name. Um, okay, let's, let's sit with this idea of a bodhisattva. Um, I guess I don't need to write on the board. I'll write in the chat. Bodhisattva. Actually, no, I will write on the board because I want to elaborate on it. Um, let's see, you guys can see, right? So, bodhisattva. There are two parts to this word. Um, sattva means being. And bodhi means enlightenment. So this is a being, right? Like a human being, just some, some kind of being, doesn't have to be a human being. A being who is dedicated to the pursuit of enlightenment. So this is it's a very important term in Buddhism. I try to um, limit the terms that I give you because I know that it can be really overwhelming. It's probably one of the hardest parts of learning Buddhism is there's a lot of new terminology, a lot of new ideas, many different languages, right? This is a Sanskrit word. So it's an Indian word. Um, maybe you guys have heard of this before, Sanskrit. Uh, most of the names and terms that I'm gonna give you are from the Sanskrit language, but all of this gets translated into Chinese, like I said before, into Tibetan. And so we could read this word in Tibetan is Chanchu Semba, in Chinese it's Pusa, right? And so across all these different languages, you have different pronunciations, but pretty similar understanding. It's the same concept. It just gets translated across different traditions. Um, so for our purposes, uh, it, when we read this book, you might've noticed the Bodhisattva does this, the Bodhisattva does that. That's how he is, that's his, basically his name or his title. Uh, throughout most of this book, until he achieves enlightenment. Now, why don't they call him the Buddha before he achieves enlightenment? Why do they call him the Bodhisattva? Are you guys able to answer that question? Anybody in the chat? I'll write it down. Why not call, let's say, why call him the Bodhisattva? and not the Buddha before he achieves enlightenment. Yeah, it's because he did not achieve enlightenment, because of the path to enlightenment, while well, the Buddha is enlightened. Yeah, exactly. So the Buddha is not his name, right? It's, again, more of a title. And in fact, as we'll see, um, there are many Buddhas, uh, at least for certain traditions, there are many Buddhas. A Buddha has to be enlightened. Before that, you are Bodhisattva trying to achieve enlightenment. All right, good. So it sounds like we're all on the same page with that. Um, I'm going to put my jacket on because it makes me look more official. A Buddha has to be enlightened. Yeah, all right. So we got it all. Um, so very good. So Bodhisattva is, again, this sort of his title before he's a Buddha. The Buddha uh, is his title after he's enlightened. Um, and his name as a prince is Siddhartha. And maybe that's a name you've heard before. Maybe you had to read Siddhartha when you were in high school. Did anybody have to read that? Herman Hesse. Um, so, so, okay, so that's uh, some terminology. There's also this sense of uh, dedication and compassion, right? He's dedicated to this pursuit of enlightenment, as we can see throughout the book. It's kind of his his primary thought, right, at least um, before he becomes a human, and, and uh, then when he becomes kind of dissatisfied with the world, he becomes very dedicated to this path, right, so it's a, a, if we look back at this introduction where the, where Curtis Schaefer elaborates on what it means for him to be a bodhisattva on Roman numeral eight, um, we see kind of two sides to it, right? So he, um, 
Let's see, I'll just read all the slides. He's a living, thinking being whose only goal is to achieve enlightenment. Yeah, there it is. Um, so his only goal is to achieve enlightenment. That's one part of being a bodhisattva. Another part is there's this compassion element too, right? Where he's trying to help everybody else. The Buddha is a savior, a being whose empathy for the suffering of others is so profound that he cannot but act on their behalf. So these two come together to make the bodhisattva, right? On the one hand, he wants enlightenment for himself. He wants to end suffering for himself. On the other hand, he wants to do that for other beings as well. Um, and then this last one, this idea of being the cosmos, again, if we kind of rewind, we can see the Buddha was, is, ever will be the cosmos, is a little bit of a confusing term. Can anybody make sense of that? It sounds like you can, you, you're all got a pretty good handle on Bodhisattva. What does it mean for him to be the cosmos? I'll, as you're thinking about it, I'll read it to you. So this paragraph on, on Roman numeral eight, he was, is, ever will be the cosmos. His body, right? His body is coextensive with all that is. He is reality as such. He seeks through the, the drama of human embodiment to relieve the suffering that comes to those beings who do not understand that they are this reality as well. Who can make sense of this, this paragraph? He is everything. Yeah. Can you say more, Aiden? What does it mean to say that he is everything? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so if you guys couldn't hear it, Lauren, um, Lauren made a comparison to God with a capital G, like a monotheistic God. And in your intro classes, you probably learn like there's no God with a capital G in Buddhism. The Buddha is not a God. But I, I think Lauren's observation is a great one, right? It's basically saying the Buddha is everywhere. The Buddha is everything. And if we, uh, let's see, what does Kyla say? Once enlightened can embody and understand all the world and its beings, right? If we think, what does it mean to be a Buddha? Um, one term that shows up a lot is omniscience. Omniscience which um, I'm sure at least some of you know, right? Omniscience, what is omniscience? Not to be confused with omnipotence. Omnipotence. Omniscience, anyone? Omni is... Right. Yes, it is. Very good. Latin roots, everybody. Yeah, so omni is everything, is all. So omniscient is all-knowing. Omnipotent is all-powerful. Um, the Buddha is, according to, you know, again, the, this system, uh, omniscient means that the Buddha knows everything, it does, but he is not omnipotent, at least. Um, maybe this is one way we can kind of draw a line between the Buddha and God with a capital G is even if he is kind of plugged into everything, knows everything, arguably his enlightenment imbues everything and pervades everything. Again, according to this explanation, um, that doesn't mean he's in charge, right? It doesn't mean he's giving out karma or punishing people or helping people or that sort of thing, right? So slight difference there, but I think Lauren's observation is still, it still stands. It's a very good one um, that, Again, this idea that the Buddha is the cosmos is really um, approaching this idea of a God with a capital G pretty meaningfully. Um, so again, if we rewind back to these identities, not all Buddhists would agree with this. As I told you, this is coming from a, a Tibetan author and a, a particular kind of Buddhism. But this is also, we could say, I would say, let's say the, the most advanced form of Buddhism, just in the sense that it's the latest development. So some early, more conservative Buddhists might say they don't really like this part. They might take that out. They might even take out, actually, this part everybody would basically agree, but this part not everybody agrees on. So um, I wanted to introduce it early, though, because it's part of this book, right? It's part of this telling. It's part of this story. So I wanted to just bring your awareness to it. And we'll come back to really all of these ideas um, in meaningful ways. So I, I just couldn't kind of want to introduce them here in the introduction. Um, questions about this before we go on? So now we can kind of start to get into the book itself. 
Okay. Um, okay. So why don't we do an activity, right? So I've been talking a lot. It's late. I think one major challenge of this class is going to be staying awake. <laughs> and uh, so one way we can do that is by getting you guys doing stuff. So um, there's a movie called The Little Buddha, which was made in 1993. And what I want to do now is compare The Little Buddha with the life of the Buddha that we are reading here. So I'm gonna show you a film clip. And as you watch it, I want you to think what is the same and what is different. Um, I think I wrote, yeah, I want you to identify one of each um, and then we will break out into groups and talk about it, right? So as you watch, just think, how does this compare, right? How does this compare to the version that we read uh, before class today? Um, and then of course, why does it matter, right? That's always an important thing to think about too. Um, all right, so let's open this up. We'll watch a few clips today, actually. Um, let me get rid of these. And I, just to set the movie up, as you can see, this is a mother and her son. I think they're in a bath, I want to say. That's why his hair is wet. Um, she's going to read him a story. And it's kind of a frame story. So this is a movie. Uh, it's aged kind of poorly to be honest i guess it's almost 30 years old so you can't blame it too much but um it's basically about a tibetan monk who is trying to find his the reincarnation of his deceased master and i think it might be this little kid this little white boy from seattle um and so the little kid is learning the life story of the buddha and as he learns it they show these and so we're going to watch just the clip. All right, so here we go. Buddha was born 2,500 years ago. In a small kingdom in ancient India. My bad. I'm going to pause the uh, recording. Yet if I don't. All right, and we're back. Um, so how are your conversations? Does anybody want to share what they found? So, of course, again, we were comparing the movie to the book. Uh, looking for similarities and differences, reading through and trying to find kind of specific passages. Um, as I warned you before, it's a challenging book. There are going to be a lot of details you'll read and you'll be like, I don't know what the hell they're talking about there. And that's okay, right? Because it's a translation, you're not going to get every detail. The goal is to get something, right? Rather than get everything, the goal is to get something. And I know when I first started reading this kind of stuff, that really bothered me. I'm the kind of person who wants to like know everything, which is why... I did a PhD on this sort of stuff. Um, but at the same time, yeah, at the beginning, it, it is challenging. And of course, I'm here to help. If you ever come across something, you think, hey, what is an era of light and an era of darkness? What the hell is that talking about? You know, I'm, I'm at your service. So um, anyways, yeah, did, what did you guys come up with? You guys want to start us? Or? Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, one thing that, um, one difference that my group and I agreed on was that uh, Buddha, Bodhisattva was born um, dressed, and that's on page 59, but in the film, um, Bodhisattva was not. Uh-huh. Now, one thing I realized as we were in the breakout groups is that not everybody has the same version, right? So maybe we can talk about... I do like the page numbers and I love that you guys were looking at specific pages. We can also talk about chapters, right? So for me, chapter three is the birth, right? And that should be true for everybody. Um, and he was born dressed, huh? So this is something we can focus on. Yeah, for me, it's page 20. He was born fully dressed. Um, and he was not born fully dressed in the film, right? Um, so now we, get, we can begin to think, why does that matter, right? Why are there these differences? Um, maybe the dress thing by itself feels a little, you know, un not like the most important thing, but I think as we stack it up with some more similarities and differences, we can start to answer that question. So maybe, yeah, why don't we get some more? Other similarities and differences, Lauren? Okay, the lotuses, yeah. So did the lotuses show up in the book? Did anybody see it in the book? It's, so it said that the gods like um uh yeah scattered flowers it's on the same page um mm -hmm. but definitely not the lotuses no 
the lotuses are there. The only reason I know this, well, I, I, it's because I read it a bunch of times. But um, yeah, on page 20, we, we read this in, in one of my groups, is um, so the Bodhi, Bodhisattva, the seven steps, right? So we saw in the film, he took these steps and the lotus flowers spring up. The Bodhisattva set foot on the earth. A magnificent lotus sprang up and grew. Behold me, he said to Indra, atop these great lotuses. He looked to the four directions and blah, blah, blah. So yeah, we do have at least one magnificent one. You're right. It is a slightly different uh, mode of presentation, but we do have this big lotus. So it begs the question, what is a lotus? Do you guys know what a lotus flower is? What does a lotus flower look like? Should we look one up? It is the one that's like on a pond, exactly. Very good. Yeah. And so lotus flowers, they're important symbols in Buddhism in particular, not only Buddhism, but Buddhism in particular. And one reason is because they do grow up out of the pond, right? So there are these beautiful flowers, as you can see, um, but they grow out of kind of like mucky, muddy water, right? And so if we think about this as a symbol for, maybe I can dim the lights a little bit. We think is this better? Yeah, we can keep it like this. Um, as we think about this as a symbol for um, the Buddha, because again, he's being born with these lotus flowers. How do we make sense of that? What do you think this mucky, gross water is? Uh, what is that a symbol for? If the Buddha is like this lotus flower that's coming out of it, what is the mucky, gross stuff? Like bringing peace in like a world with chaos. Ooh, peace and chaos. I love it. Yeah. So we have this beautiful flower that's coming out of this gross sullied water, but the flower is unsullied by the, the dirt and the filth that it's coming out of. The Buddha's kind of the same way, right? He's coming out into this world. He's this pristine being, right? He's this pure being who is coming into a chaotic world, a world filled with problems. And as we'll see, and as, you know, as we already saw in the reading that we prepared for today, his main issue is suffering, right? That's really what the Buddha is trying to figure out. That's the nut that he's trying to crack. Uh, I'll type it in the chat, suffering, right? So he's coming out into this world of suffering, but he himself is untouched by it. Is that a hand? No? Okay. Um, okay, very good. Other, other observations? Any other groups who want to add to the conversation? This is great. Um, in both the book and the film, like the tree bows to the mother. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was an interesting little part, right? Um, and again, we're looking at that same scene, right? This is slightly earlier, still the beginning of chapter three for me, uh, page 19, right? Maya came before the fig tree, the tree bowed and prayed to the Buddha's mother. Um, one interesting detail that... Um, one of the groups I was talking to noticed is um, she's by herself here, right? So in the film, she was not by herself. She had her whole posse with her, right? All these people, all these servants, all these helpers. But here, she's kind of by herself. So like Sophie is saying, um, this tree bending down to her, I guess, well, we can wonder, what do you think this symbolizes? If, if you know, the, the lotus flower is a symbol of purity that's springing out from a sullied world. What do you think this tree bowing down might symbolize here? Nothing? Trees? Has a tree ever bowed uh, down? Like, like in all power, like coming down and like giving him a hand or like supporting him or something. Well, it, and it would be her, right? So we're still talking about the Buddha's mother at this point, although we can wonder why, and maybe it does come back to him. And th this is something um, I encourage you to keep an eye open uh, for. Really? Oh, I heard uh, some almost voices. Respect, recognition that he's a higher being, God's way to help her. Yeah, so again, on that, that preceding paragraph, right? Um, she comes to this tree. The tree had long been a support for mothers of Buddhas in the past. The gods of pure realms pray to it even now. And so it's almost like 
the gods are bending down to her. Mother Earth is bending down to her, right? The tree spirit, whatever it is, is bending down to her. There's definitely some kind of natural spiritual thing happening there. Um, and so then on the next page, we find that she's actually not alone even, right? The tree is there with her, of course, but then there are other gods too. And so this is something I left one group with, and I'm curious to hear what they came up with. Why do you think the gods were left out of the movie? Why were they replaced with humans? Who was, who was I talking to? It was Astrid and Greg, wasn't it? What did you guys come up with? I was guessing that the presence of two gods would be too much for an American audience. So like they wouldn't comprehend it. Interesting. Too much for an American audience. I, I agree with you. And it, obviously this is an open question, right? We'd have to talk to the director to really get um, to get the truth, right? But we had like the fantastic lotus flowers. We had the tree bending down. Like, oh, that's pretty supernatural, right? Why do you think the gods are like a step too far? You know, why is that too much for America? Is that a hand on? Trying to think, okay. Why are the gods a step too far? Westerners know Buddhism as Buddha being only and all God. Yeah, so... Um, Again, if we think about this blind man and the elephant thing, right? We've got this here. Um, maybe that's a side of Buddhism that we tend to kind of leave out in our usual presentation, right? We like the Buddha as a very special person, but he's still a person and he's sort of separate from the gods, right? The gods don't really get a seat at the table in our Western version of Buddhism. But as we read, and I encourage you to keep your eyes open for this, the gods are everywhere. It's like a team effort, you know, they're really invested in him. Again, if we, if we look at page 20, um, the gods are scattering flowers. They received him in a celestial muslin wrap. So they wrap him up the minute he, he comes out of his mother. Um, there are serpent kings. And so all of these deities are coming out and supporting the Buddha. And, you know, we got to wonder, why are the gods so supportive of him? I guess, first of all, have you guys heard of Brahma and Indra before? We talked about them before, didn't we? Remember them? Brahma and Indra. What religion are they from? Are they 100% Buddhist? They Hinduism. Hinduism, yeah. So that's maybe another reason, right? We often think like, all right, Buddhism is over here. Hinduism is over there. Totally separate. But as we can see, there's actually a lot of blurring, right? In the same way that, for example, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, they share a lot of the same prophets, they share a lot of the same stories. Hinduism and Buddhism, they also share a lot, right? And so maybe the director was thinking it'd be simpler to kind of leave all the Hinduism out and keep all the Buddhism. But the reality is the gods are part of Buddhism, right? These are the same gods, just to remind you, that are at the top of the wheel, right? They are on this map here, right? And they're going around in the cycle just like everybody else. So maybe it's worth thinking about, why are they helping the Buddha? What, what is, what's in it for them? Why are the gods invested in this little kid? Division. Can you say more, Aiden? What do you mean? Division. Uh, maybe to like force a force upon the, the people of like Hinduism, give them another path. Uh huh. So, okay, so you're thinking they're like coming in to represent Hinduism somehow? You could say that, but it's important to keep in mind this is a story told by Buddha, right? It sounds like someone's trying to talk, but I'm not really getting it. Um, he has the potential to help many others find enlightenment. He's going to inspire and lead others. Yeah, I think we're starting to get to it, right? It's the same reason that Indra and Brahma were bowing down to him before. Remember that? I had an image where the Buddha is sitting in the middle. The two gods are bowing down to him. They want help. They want knowledge, right? What kind of knowledge do they want? It's the kind that Kyla and Astrid are talking about here, right? They want to find enlightenment, not just for everybody else, for themselves. I know it's sort of counterintuitive, but even the gods suffer. 
And why do the gods suffer? Is because they're not going to be gods forever. They're going to die. They're going to be reborn. And again, that's why I've been pushing. That's why I've been pushing rebirth so hard in this class. Is because it's a really central part of Buddhism. And um, if we take it out, then we lose a lot of these details, right? So the gods want to learn too. They want to learn what the Buddha has to teach. Um, okay, it's almost eight. A lot of similarities to the story of Jesus. Yes, uh, which could be the reason why. And maybe one God to help people understand similarity to that of Jesus. So Kevin's comparing this to Jesus. And I, I would encourage that up to a certain point, right? So if we look at um, his birth, for example, a very unusual birth. And I, I know it's getting late and we're getting tired. We're gonna, well, let's take a break. I realize we took the break uh, around now last time, but then I feel like the second half kind of dragged. So why don't we try to push on for another like 15 minutes? Does that sound good? 15 minutes, then we'll take a break. Um, so here's uh, an illustration of the birth. And as you can see, we've got all these gods hanging out, right? So this four-faced one is Brahma. This one with a bunch of eyes on him is Indra. And I think Stephen and Sophie might remember why he has a bunch of eyes on him, because they took a class with me before and we talked about it. Um, as you can see, the Buddha is coming out of her right side. Do you notice that detail? He's popping out of her right hip. Um, is that how babies are usually born? We got any pre-med students in the, in the, in the class? <laughs> We're going to go out on a limb and say no, right? That is not how babies are usually born. Uh, as you can see, she's holding on to a tree here. And this might be like an embodiment of the tree. I'm not really sure who this is, but some kind of goddess helping her out. Um, and so we're left wondering, coming back to, I think it was Alexandra's initial observation. He's dressed. He has this golden complexion. He has these lotus flowers. He's saying things. The gods are catching him. What's the deal? Why are we, why are we talking about this, this guy in this crazy way? Why, and why is he being born from his mother's side instead of where babies are usually born? What's the deal with that? And as you're thinking about it, to connect to Jesus, right? Here we have a story of a special baby who is born without sex, right? There's that, that dirty act of sexual intercourse that Jesus was able to avoid. Um, he's different. He's born in a spiritual and special way, yeah. Um, I think it is assumed that the Buddha's parents did have sex, and um, they don't dwell on it, but they don't leave it out either. Why not the vagina? Why isn't he being born the way that babies are normally born? Is it just because it's special? There is a- Did they a, say something about, oh, sorry. Please, go ahead, Sylvia. I was just gonna say, it's like, um, it would be like impure and like they, they emphasize in the book, like it's like he was like above that almost. And then it also talks about like, he was in like a palace while in the womb. So like, he was like even too good to just be like hanging out in the normal womb. Yes, thank you, Sophie. Um, and so we've talked a lot about chapter three because this is, you know, what the movie clip was really focused on. Um, but if we look at the previous chapter, there's all this crazy stuff about this giant palace in the in the womb, a height of six million four hundred thousand leagues, and all these gods come to visit him, and they're all worshiping him while he's in his mother's womb. None of that made it to Hollywood, right? All of that got left out. And of course, before that, he was also up in heaven making vows and all these sorts of things. So it's worth wondering, you know, where, I guess, what, why is this left out? Maybe kind of like we were saying, it's just not going to work for Hollywood. But uh, the more interesting question is, why is it included? And I think Sophie's, ma Sophie's making a good point. If we think about kind of the defiled nature of the world, this is being mapped onto a woman's body. It's saying a woman's body is impure. And this kind of misogyny does run through Buddhism. So women uh, who are having their period are not allowed to attend certain events. They're seen as impure because their bodily functions are particularly active at those moments. And so when we see the Buddha dressed and coming out of his mother's side, uh, there's a sense that he is unaffected by the impurities of his mother's womb. And so again, as we study Buddhism, there is this misogynistic streak that will run through it. Um, and we can maybe try to understand why it's there, but I, I encourage you to also call 
misogyny for what it is. You guys know this word, misogyny? Uh, this is specific to all kinds of Buddhism, but yeah, Tibetan Buddhism included. It's, it's really across the board. Um, spiritual, special way, impurities of the womb. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so if you think about it, you know, this is going to just me talking off the cuff because it's 8 p.m. now. Um, any religion that is run by men who shave their head and don't have sex with women, there's going to be some misogyny in it. It's basically just a religious trap, you know, and so um, we, we shouldn't be surprised when they act that way. Um, so this was a really good conversation. Uh, I've made a bunch of slides that we don't have to go to in a lot of detail. Um, there's some nice images of the elephant entering his mother's womb. Why don't we um, just take a break now? I think we're all kind of tired and um, we can come back. I can maybe lecture a little bit, go through some of those slides, and then we can hit the second half. I've even made an intermission slide for us. Um, so why don't we take a break? It is now 8.05. Let's come back at 8.15. Is that exactly what we did last time? Let's push it back five minutes. Let's say 8.20, okay? Um, and then that'll leave an hour and 15 left, right? So that's perfect. So, okay, so let's take a break. Take a break. Come back at 8.20, please. Um, and so, yeah, I'm gonna go dark now. Any questions before we disappear? Okay.